This meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We will continue on Senate File 3035, Senator Champion's omnibus bill. Um, but before that, I believe Senator Champion had a, a – we recently passed the A18 amendment, and I believe you would like to reconsider it because you had to amend – or we could just – we don't have to reconsider, just yes. move some edits to the amendment you already adopted. Okay, okay. so Could that's you, my motion. Yeah, so Senator Champion, you've got some edits to the A18 amendment you'd like Mr. to Mr. Chair? Go for. That is correct. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I think we do have to reconsider the amendment. We yes. can't just make edits to an amendment that's already been adopted. We could amend the bill which contains this in it, either then way. We would need a, then we would need a new amendment in front of us. It would be right, a, it would be an oral amendment, but that's fine. If you prefer it to do it that way, I think it's six of one half dozen the other, but Senator Champion moves we reconsider the A18 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. So On the A18 amendment, Senator Champion, you wanted to amend it. Yes, that is correct. I'm going to have Ms. Noner uh, go through and identify uh, the changes that we want to make. Mr. Chair and committee members, on page two of the A18, um, there just was some math that needed to be corrected. So on line 2.18, uh, instead of 22,904,000, this should read 24,904,000. And then on line 2.19, that'll be the same change. So instead of 222,904,000, it should read 24,904,000. And then on the carve-outs for this appropriation, uh, these just need to be updated to reflect that total. Um, and again, that's not changing the original appropriation. It just needed to be updated. Um, so on line 2.20, um, instead of 16,300,000, 16, it should read 17,500,000. On line 2.21, instead of 1,400,000, it should read 1,700,000. And on line 2.22, instead of 5,204,000, should read 5,704,000. And with that, that should correct the, the error in the amendment. Okay. And, Sir Champion, you, are you incorporating those into it? And we'll just... Okay. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Champion's offering the A18 with those number changes incorporated in them. Is everybody aware what those number changes are? And is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Um, Senator Champion, ready for Ms. Yes. Doyle Fontaine to go through the language? That is what we'd like to do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So uh, Ms. Noldner went through the Article 1, which is the appropriations in the spreadsheet. And then Article 2, it starts on page 45 of uh, Senate File 3035, the first engrossment. This article pertains to Explore Minnesota, which is currently known as Explore Minnesota Tourism. And most of this article really is um, sort of making those changes uh, to sort of rebrand Explore Minnesota Tourism into Explore Minnesota and then creates two divisions, which are Explore Minnesota Tourism and then Explore Minnesota for Business. The, this article also expands some of the duties for Explore Minnesota and um, those are, those are some of the related costs are, that are the additional appropriations um, for Explore Minnesota Tourism. So that is uh, that article, Article 2. Article 3 starts on page 52 of the first engrossment. This is the Promise Act. Uh, Ms. Noldner went, went through the amounts that are appropriated for these purposes. Their first Section 2 of this article is for the Promise Grant Program. And that allows uh, grants to be made through partner organizations of up to $50,000 per grant to businesses in the areas identified within the uh, writers that Ms. Noldner went through. And then section three is the Promise Loan Program. And that allows for loans to be made through partner organizations of up to $1 million per loan in the, uh, to businesses in the areas identified. 
Article 4 contains the employment and economic development provisions. This mainly, uh, most of these provisions came from the uh, governor's, governor's bill. But what I will point out are a couple of new offices and new grant programs that were funded um, within this bill. So Section 1 contains the, is the Office of Child Care Community Partnerships. This would create an office um, within DEED to coordinate various child care initiatives. Then we have uh, the Office of New Americas. New Americans is also created. There's a Small Business Assistance Partnership Program. The Minnesota Expanding Opportunity Fund Program, there's language that creates that and specifies um, the purposes uh, for, for that program. The Launch Minnesota Program that's, that has been uh, uncodified since 2019 is, is codified in this article. The Minnesota Forward Fund is also created and that language is contained in this article. There are some modifications to existing programs, the Youth Build Program, and the Minnesota Youth Program. Ms. Noldner also mentioned some changes to the Destination Medical Center, some uh, changes regarding state transit aid and uh, some additional costs there. And then finally, Section 24 it is the Minnesota Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund. This is a pilot program that would reimburse eligible employers for expenses related to providing reasonable, reasonable accommodations for individuals with a disability who are applicants or employees of the employer. And then finally, there's Article 5 that starts on page 90. These are some miscellaneous provisions that were added by the Senate Jobs Committee. The first section codifies the Getting to Work grant program. This is a program that's also <clears throat> been funded in the past, and this helps with um, repair and maintaining motor vehicles to get uh, to allow people to obtain or maintain employment through uh, transportation of, uh, through a vehicle. And then there are sections two to four contain some modifications to the energy transition grant program. And there, then section five is a new program that was a bill from Senator Champion. This creates the Emerging Developer Fund program that would provide uh, loans to emerging developers for eligible projects. And then the last two sections, one is a uh, forgivable loan program for remote recreational businesses. This, this uh, makes some changes to some dates in a 2021 session law. This were for forgivable loans in the North, Northwest angle. This would allow um, some businesses that, that didn't, weren't, did not get, uh, were not able to participate in this loan program to allow them to participate. And then section seven, creates a Canadian Border Counties Economic Relief Program, which is similar because they were affected um, by being on the border with, with Canada um, during COVID, and this creates an economic relief program for them. And these are all things that Ms. Nolner discussed that were, are funded um, in the bill. And that is, uh, are just some of the policy provisions that, that are being funded. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Senator Champion. Um, and what I'd like to do now, Mr. Chair, one of the things that we have tried to make certain of is that uh, the organization, the state agency deed, has the um, oversight that's necessary for both the direct loan, the, the direct appropriations, as well as for competitive uh, uh, grants as well, um, and for them to be able to come, come up and talk about how they've been able to uh, have this oversight and have been doing this oversight and why they're so successful doing it. Um, both for nonprofits and for profits, and last but certainly not least, as a part of that discussion, I'd like the commissioner also to talk about how that same level of oversight and requirement of, of, of documentation and fiscal management and oversight flows from a deed to a direct appropriation, like here in our instance, like NDC or or MEDA, and how NDC and media MEDA are still required to get the same information to who to the end user, like others, right? And provide the technical assistance that, that they need in order to make sure that the businesses, or pro provide the technical assistance to businesses in order to make sure that they are providing any and all that they need in order to be successful uh, in, in this context. So with that being said, there's uh, uh, the interim commissioner, uh, Mr. McKinnon, 
that I'd love to have come up and, and talk about uh, deed. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Kevin McKinnon, I'm the uh, temporary commissioner of deed. Um, happy to be here today uh, to talk about um, uh, uh, an issue that we take uh, very seriously uh, and certainly understand the uh, scrutiny that uh, these grants are coming with. Uh, we are proud of our uh, previous work, our audit reports that we do uh, receive. Uh, and as Senator Champion uh, mentioned, um, when we uh, administer grant programs, when we administer competitive grants, when we administer special appropriations, direct appropriations, uh, we uh, essentially follow uh, the policies that are put in place by the Department of Administration, our internal policies and procedures uh, for how we uh, administer grants. Uh, all of these uh, types of uh, policies and procedures uh, essentially come with uh, a form of application so we understand what the projects are, what the money will be used for, uh, can the organizations um, deliver on what they say they can deliver on. Uh, we do financial examinations, uh, uh, risk assessments essentially uh, of the applicants uh, who receive these, uh, re receive these awards. Of course, uh, there is also a grant agreement process that we go through, and once you do that, uh, essentially what that means is uh, we have a grant manager that's assigned to that organization who then does all the grant monitoring of it, does all the disbursement of the money, uh, goes out and verifies that uh, the work is taking place, the money was spent appropriately, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, completes uh, the reporting functions of uh, the individual grant uh, and, or, and or the program. Um, uh, so as we uh, deal with this, not only um, uh, uh, through nonprofits, uh, as an example, if we are granting money to uh, another organization that then is passing that on, those grants on to other organizations, uh, we, we work in a similar fashion. So we would expect that the organization that is uh, dealing with the individual business in this case uh, would then be looking at uh, the history of, of the organizations that they're working with, uh, the financial capacity of those organizations, what they're doing with the money, and then monitoring how they spend it. These are all common practices that we put in place at DEED. We've been doing this a long time. Uh, as I mentioned, we're proud of, uh, of our work. I, we realize that sometimes uh, grantees have some problems with this. Um, we take that uh, very seriously as well. Uh, we try to do as much uh, outreach and help grantees uh, and many with less capacity than others understand these processes. Uh, and quite frankly, sometimes it just does not work. Sometimes we do not enter into grant agreements uh, with folks that do not, uh, that cannot uh, follow the, uh, the, the way that we do business. Uh, and so um, with that, uh, I think I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, on our process uh, and how we deal with uh, the organizations that we serve. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just so that the committee knows, we made sure that in our bill we captured this language and, 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 and reminding Deed and others that this is the po policy and process that they have to follow in order to make sure that we are being good stewards of uh, Minnesotans' money. Um, I didn't hear the commissioner uh, talk about for-profits, like what's the process for for-profits? Because one of the things that I've often said is I just like to make sure that there is accountability on both sides of the equation and that we are not speaking out of just one side of a frame, but what are the safeguards in place uh, that they do for for-profits. And it's my understanding they have safeguards, they've been doing them for quite some time, and, um, and the commissioner can speak to that, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, uh, yes, there is uh, policies and actual statute that we follow when dealing with um, for-profit entities. Uh, that's uh, basically 116J.993, which is business subsidy law. 
Uh, we uh, have a variety of um, uh, procedures that we enter into formal grant agreements um, and we have specific instructions how we uh, are able to um, work with entities uh, that maybe do not meet the qualifications of programs or meet the the uh, qualifications of the grant agreement to recollect that money as well. Um, and so uh, that exists under uh, our statutes, uh, business subsidy law. Uh, that flows through not only to us, but also to uh, entities that we would grant uh, funds to, like cities as an example. Uh, they would have to do uh, business subsidy agreements as they pass uh, money through uh, as well. Uh, there are specific requirements within that, uh, and of course, uh, the way we deal with it, and specifically related to businesses, uh, we're obviously looking at credit history, history of the business, the um, uh, uh, customers, the markets, etc., of businesses that are receiving this money, uh, and their ability to uh, not only receive it, but execute on it uh, in uh, almost all cases, uh, these funds are reimbursable. Uh, so businesses are actually spending money first, um, and then we would ensure that the money was spent appropriately, uh, and then ultimately reimburse uh, later. So that's generally how we deal with uh, for-profit uh, entities. And Mr. Chair, Sorry. lastly, and I think the commissioner mentioned this, but it's my understanding even for grants, you know, if the entity whether it's a direct appropriation or competitive grant, if they do not, if the entity doesn't fulfill the requirements of, of supplying all the information that they are supposed to, then it's my understanding there's no contract that's entered into and there's no money that goes to that entity. That's my understanding. And maybe the commissioner just can confirm that for the record. That is, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senator Champion, that is correct. Um, Maybe, uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with them, but yes, this happens from time to time uh, where uh, we just do not enter into grant agreements with uh, entities that cannot conform, uh, cannot provide the uh, uh, data, uh, cannot provide or do not have the capacity to actually uh, administer uh, the grants. Um, it does happen. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we do try to work with grantees ahead of time uh, to help them understand the requirements. Uh, to some, and particularly smaller businesses or smaller nonprofits, as an example, uh, some of these things may seem burdensome, um, but they're there for a purpose and a purpose that we take very seriously. Uh, and uh, we do acknowledge that we can uh, continue to do a better job of working with these organizations to help them. Uh, and uh, developing other organizations with capacity to help these organizations actually uh, administer a lot of these grants. Uh, so generally uh, across both for-profit, non-profit uh, entities, that's how, that's how we, um, that's how we engage with the, with, with the grantees and certainly with uh, a lot of the organizations that um, may lack some capacity initially uh, that are applying for funds. Thank you, um, Commissioner, both one for your agency's diligence in this and also Senator Champion for your attention to this matter. Um, are there other questions on that? And then wanted to give the Commissioner if he wants to speak to anything else in the bill. But Senator... Sis. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. So with, with capital investment, a lot of those projects go through deed, whether they're using bonds or whether they're using cash. So, and I think a lot of organizations don't understand both that um, the state is the last dollar in and they have to raise all the money for their project as, as described in the, uh, the appropriation. And I myself forgot that it's also reimbursable. So you have to have an, an entity that has the ability to do the cash flow when they're working with the state. Um, my question is, Commissioner, about timeliness and staffing, because we have had concerns expressed that it took deed nine months to get the money out the door, you know, almost into the next legislative session. And I assume that's a staffing issue. And is, um, 
Is there a champion, you know, beefing up your staff enough? I know I talked to him <laughs> about this um, so that you're going to be able to do that in a, in a more timely fashion because I know that need is out there. Construction costs are going up about 1% a month and uh, we've got to get these, you know, this money out the door. Thank you. Any, any response? Go ahead. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pappas, the, uh, that, that is correct. And specifically on the reimbursement uh, issue and, and uh, of course, uh, in capital investment, we're dealing with MMB uh, mm -hmm. as well and Department of Admin on, uh, on our other grant uh, contract sides. Um, but yes, uh, staffing is an issue. I'm sure you're all aware of staffing issues all across the state. Uh, we're no different. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, yes, there could be staffing issues from a timeliness perspective. Um, oftentimes it's also um, working with grantees uh, to ensure that they can comply. Uh, so that often takes a lot of time as well. Uh, oftentimes we're working through attorneys and our attorneys are going back and forth on grant agreements. So there's often very good reasons why uh, some of this uh, can be delayed, uh, and also the sheer volume of things that, that may come at us at, at a given time. Uh, I think uh, our agency performed very well uh, in uh, and during COVID and how quickly we uh, reacted. Um, one of the issues uh, that was that I just would like to say during COVID, we had all kinds of exemptions. Senator Pratt uh, is uh, well aware of this and in running our uh, programs. Um, and, and we tried to adhere to every policy and procedure that we could uh, during uh, the execution of those programs. And, and again, I'm just proud of how our agency responded and, and, and how the auditor looked at it and, uh, and how we did adhere to a lot of the policies and procedures that already exist. So thank you for those comments. Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. And to, to that, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Pappas, one of the things that I have talked to Deed about uh, is some of the staffing that they have, and so there's money in the bill that helps them with staffing and other things. But another interesting component that we have here is uh, in my discussions uh, with Deed, it's about are there any entities that, it, that will be an extension of Deed in the community who has uh, not only the fiscal management and the capacity, but also the reach in the community to be able to help execute some of these things. So that's where your NDC comes in and your media comes in. And those organizations, as an example, because there's others, uh, that DEED has a good relationship with and, and they've had this opportunity to work with each other. So there's an opportunity to help with staffing from that vantage point, and then also in the community where, like for an example, we think it's important for NDC and, and MEDA and others to also think about our, our uh, immigrant community. Do, um, are they able to uh, make sure they deal with the language barrier and some, some, some marketing and some outreach and provide the technical assistance? Because we don't want to be in a situation where we provide this this transformational opportunity and people can't take advantage of it because of the other things. But we know that there's capacity building needs and we want to do that and that's where technical assistance and relationships and um, having the confidence not just of NDC but also the community-based uh, folks as well. Thank you, Senator Champion and Commissioner. Commissioner, as I said, we didn't call you up here for specifically, we did ask questions about the accountability issues, but do you have any other general comments you wanted to make about the bill? You don't need to, but go ahead. Sure, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. First of all, I'd just like to uh, thank Senator Champion, uh, Senator Muhammad, uh, Senator Dreheim, and Senator Pratt for all of their work, uh, obviously, in, in the committee. Uh, uh, lots of our uh, priorities are included here. Uh, we have a lot of shared goals that are very clear here. I look forward to working with the Senate uh, and the House to finalize this. We realize that there's still some work to do and, and uh, happy with the collaboration uh, uh, that does exist. So thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing me to comment on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions for the Commissioner? If not, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, discussion of the bill, Senator Champion. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Chair, I would 
also like to have circulated and offer the A20 amendment. Okay. A20 amendment is being, looks like it's about to be distributed. Thank you. I don't have it. It's coming right now. It's being distributed now. Um, Ms. Doyle Fontaine, were you the one who wants to explain this? Or Senator Champion? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, members. So uh, the, the Finance Committee has been uh, looking at an amendment that required some financial requirements for nonprofit organizations prior to the grants going out. And we were, uh, there was a discussion prior to this coming back into this meeting. And for now, uh, this amendment is, is being offered by Senator Champion to address some issues just regarding uh, what the grant requirements are. And this would be for any organization, for profit or nonprofit. It sim simply um, provides that for any grant that is made with money appropriated in the act, would be subject to any grant requirements that are imposed by law, which would include rules, and then also references uh, a couple of Department of Administration statutes per pertaining to grant making or any agency grant policy. This just makes it clear that uh, there are no, no longer any COVID exceptions and that all the grant making requirements uh, for any grants under this act would be subject to all of the requirements that are in law. Thank you. Um, on the Champion 820 amendment, is there a discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Oops. All, all those opposed? The motion prevails. Senator Murphy, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Um, further discussion. Senator Dreheim. Yeah, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Marty, and, and thank you. Uh, Senator Champion, um, for, for bringing this bill and working so hard this year on on the Jobs Committee. Um, you know, you had mentioned earlier about the, the tracking and the discussion we just had uh, with the uh, interim commissioner or temporary commissioner or what I still haven't got down what his official title is, but I'm glad he's here. Um, on some of the uh, oversight for the for-profit companies, and, and we've had a robust discussion um, in committee too, um, but I, I think the E17 kind of gets to that um, a, a little bit. So, you know, I, I'd Senator, like to offer Senator that. Senator Dreheim, the A17 is in the packets. Senator yes, Dreheim correct. offers yep. a 17 amendment. Mr. Senator Champion does not seem to have one. Can we get him oh, one? I got it. You, you got, got one. Chair, I see it now. And uh, Chair, if I could. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, when, and this isn't new to, to um, the author. Um, this is just some um, reporting requirements. You know, we just heard from Deed that they're, they're struggling like all agencies and all employers with hiring people. This would just require um, a little bit of information how successful our programs are. And I, I, I think it's just a common sense um, little tidbit I'd like to add to the bill. And, and I, if nonpartisan would like to add anything to it, uh, that would be great. Other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. Senator, Senator Champion will comment in a minute, apparently. And Senator Draheim, this is two, just two grants that are right. designed to increase manufacturing. Senator Champion, give you a uh, chance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would be willing, well, a couple things. I was just talking to Deed about this, uh, 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 around what they do already, what information they have available already, and whether they uh, provide any um, report to the legislature already and of course they have reports that they do but um, um, if there's something that needs to happen 
uh, hear from a reporting perspective that they would find that okay. So only qualify this to say that they will continue to take a look at this and I'll accept it today as a friendly amendment, but we'll certainly take a look at it just to make sure it's not redundant or it's not problematic because we all want to have some, uh, some information in order to make sure that we make informed decisions. So I will see the A-17 as a, free, uh, a friendly amendment. I appreciate that. Thank you. Senator Dreheim moves the A-17 amendment on page 19. Is there a discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Further discussion, further amendments? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion and staff for the excellent work on the bill. Um, looking forward to supporting it. I noticed that you started your presentation talking about the geographic distribution. For those of us from greater Minnesota, I hope you don't mind if I ask some questions about that. I'm going through the spreadsheet for the first time this last day or so. And um, as someone from greater Minnesota, one of our um, features is that incomes are lower. And so I'm looking at the bill. And I guess my first question, Senator, I mean, is it your intention that the funds in the bill are distributed roughly equally around the state? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, it's not my intention for them to be distributed equally, but appropriately. And I think that is different because uh, there's not as much density in certain areas and there's more in others. But, but we have been really intentional around making sure that there's funds distributed all around the state. And then competitively, there's some grants that, you know, provide some, you know, equalization. But I think that could be misleading because there's just a overall difference in size. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, those are the things I want to, you know, if I can draw the committee's attention to as we work forward, you know, try to get things that we can all agree, maybe get some bipartisan support for the bill. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, in the same way, I'm watching the bonding bill, just saying I hope that our goal is as a state to have all corners of the state represented. I hope we're able to earn bipartisan support for those bills. Um, I had uh, looked at the Promise Act appropriations because to my ear, it represented some things that are important to greater Minnesota. And just to highlight some of those for you again as we go forward, um, preference for support includes uh, businesses owned by BIPOC individuals, veterans, and women. Uh, as we know, demographically, a greater proportion of veterans come from greater Minnesota, so that appeals to those of us from greater Minnesota. Um, also, the business eligibility has to include consideration of lack of access to capital, a loss of population to an, uh, or an aging population and uh, meant to identify economic challenges facing communities of color and rural communities. Mm -hmm. So I like those criteria. I guess um, you can probably sense in the attorney that you are where I'm headed. Um, can you tell me then why the Promise Act appropriations seem to take, um, you know, the, the dollar amounts and don't appear to represent the geographic distribution of the state for rural that the two parts of Minneapolis and St. Paul are for? Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question because I anticipated that and wanted to make sure that I, I was able to address that appropriately. So when you think in terms of uh, one of the differences is because I also uh, consider civil unrest. I, I consider what, uh, what extraordinary uh, events that occurred that left communities in a challenging situation. And, and, and as you know, that that was, you know, largely Minneapolis, both North and South Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, but because I wanted to also make sure that there was this consideration around um, uh, rural Minnesota, that's why we also uh, made sure that we were connected with the Minnesota uh, Initiative uh, uh, Foundation as well. Here's the other thing. There's a difference in population and size and, the, and when you think in terms of income. And then even in greater Minnesota, we have a lot more money around uh, child care. There's stuff around the, uh, uh, the, the Northern Angle. There's Oatana. There's Steele County. There's all these other places that we try to be as thoughtful around. And, we, and that's why we also included preferences around veterans and also loss of population because we know that one of the challenges in rural Minnesota is loss of population. So we wanted to make sure that we, we were being thoughtful about those things. Now, the other thing that we heard was uh, 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 the Main Street grants was helpful to some individuals, but wasn't as helpful with certain populations. And so we wanted to make sure that we were respectful and thoughtful of that. Did it help someone? Absolutely. 
did it really help those other smaller and, and, and mom and pop businesses? That's where there was a challenge because guess what? It required a match. It, re it required some other things. Important from a fiscal perspective, but when you think about having impact, uh, that would be important. And one of the things that I want to make sure I note for you, uh, because I think that's important, is that when, when we think in terms of the investments of, of, around the state, there's a, a vast majority of funding being available for statewide usage and over 70 million targeted specifically to greater Minnesota. So thank you, a uh, 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 wonderful uh, Senator. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. Next time I'm gonna have a question that you're not prepared for, but not today. I appreciate the fact that you know your bill as well as you do. And I, I'm, I'm glad to just draw, before I vote for the bill, to just draw attention to those criteria because aging population uh, and other features of greater Minnesota, um, hopefully all Minnesotans wanna have success. And when we have lower average incomes in the outstate part, um, so I think it's part of our job here to call attention to and as the only member of the DFL delegation to the Finance Committee who does not represent either part of Minneapolis or St. Paul, if I don't say this stuff, who's going to say it? So with that, I uh, look forward to voting for your bill, Senator Champion, and thank you again. And Mr. Chair, if I can say one thing before Senator Pratt, I think he looks like he's going to ask a question. One of the things that Senator Pratt and I have been talking about is that when you think in terms of the uh, metropolitan area and then you go out to greater Minnesota which we've had we have a great investment around that there's some some questions around what the investment for its suburbs right how do we make sure that they're identified in a way where they, they don't feel left behind yeah there's competitive grants yes there's those other things but but I did make a commitment that I'll continue to explore that and find creative ways by which to make sure that they feel as if they're one Minnesota as well and Senator Friends, just to correct the record, I don't represent anything in Minneapolis or St. Paul or inner ring suburbs. It's this second, third, fourth, third, fourth, fifth ring suburbs. So. Hang on, Mr. Chair. Did you or did you not represent part I of St. Paul? I did represent St. Paul in the past. I stand corrected. So it's only five of the seven <laughs> DFL members that represent Is part of Is there further discussion Paul? on Senate File 3035? If not, as I indicated, we're going to Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Senator Champion, you were right. I did have I did have a few <laughs> comments. You read me so well, um, and I'm gonna. I just want to uh, piggyback a little bit on on Senator Francis' questions because we had this discussion in in the Jobs Committee as well. Uh, you know, following the, the riots and the destruction in Minneapolis, we did set up the Main Street and Redevelopment Fund, and that was a uh, collaboration between Representative Knorr, uh, Commissioner Grove, and myself to, to make sure that happened. Um, and we did that intentionally as a statewide program. Um, now, there, was, there were a couple of flaws in the program. Um, one was structural in that we required that uh, a community work through a CDFI or uh, uh, an economic development uh, entity, and what we found was that in Hennepin and Ramsey County, there were uh, organizations that could help. In Greater Minnesota, you had the Initiative Foundations, but in the five suburban ring counties uh, that were also impacted uh, and needed economic development coming out of out of COVID, um, they didn't have those those opportunities. And so that's the that's the gap that Senator uh, Champion was talking about. And uh, so many of these communities in those in those um, ring counties, uh, some look like Shakopee and Prior Lake. They're full-fledged suburbs. Some, like Senator Drangheim uh, represents in Scott County, look more like rural communities. And there was there was an issue uh, with that. The other issue was that I believe some of the grants were. Um, I don't want to say erroneously uh, given, um, but weren't given with uh, with the right and how do I want to say this? Some of the grants that were given weren't given to organizations that had projects that were ready to go. And it took a long time for the organization, particularly one, uh, 
to get those funds out to the people that it was intended to. I believe, I believe uh, Senator Champion and I were having conversations with that organization nine months after the grant had been awarded, and we were still waiting for that money to hit the street. I don't know that that was a problem with the Main Street uh, redevelopment program as much as it was that the grant was given to an organization that wasn't ready to, uh, to distribute it. And we could have certainly looked at some opportunity to reinvigorate the Main Street Development Fund as a statewide program versus what I think you correctly identified here as the Promise, the promise Fund as, as more of a uh, local or regional uh, type of program. Senator Champion mentioned the the uh, matching grant or the matching requirements, and that was intentional because what we wanted to do as a state was to signal that we wanted uh, that we want to uh, encourage private investment in these areas, private investment down the Lake Street corridor, private investment in in, in uh, North Minneapolis, private investment in Belle Plaine, Minnesota. Um, that we would step up with 30% of the, of the money in a, in a grant or a loan program, um, but only if we could get enough support for private investment to come in and fill the gap and, and take over most of that funding. Because we as a state don't want to be the only entity that's investing in our communities. You know, when I, I've often talked about one of the key uh, objectives of the Jobs Committee is to make Minnesota a great place to invest. And uh, so it was intentional that we wanted this also, we wanted these nonprofits, we wanted these agencies, we wanted these, these CDFIs, uh, we wanted these entrepreneurs to go out and, 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 and build projects that would have real significance to their communities. And you can only do that if you have private investment willing to come in and support uh, the state investment. So I, I continue to be disappointed that, you know, we've, we've created a new loan and grant program uh, outside the Main Street Redevelopment Loan and Grant Program, Center Champion. And, and, and while I appreciate that we added in the 10-year uh, program on the grants, if a grant's used to, to acquire property, that uh, there's a 10-year there's a waiting period before that property could be sold. I still, just as I mentioned yesterday, have a problem with grant funds being used to acquire hard assets. And that was also an intentional restriction in the grant portion of the Main Street Redevelopment Program, but was certainly an option under the grant, Main Street uh, Guaranteed Loan Program. Um, something that I, I didn't mention in, in the jobs committee and I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk about it here was the codification of Launch Minnesota. And uh, again, I was, uh, I was an active part of creating Launch Minnesota with the intention that it would spin off. And if you'll look at the previous legislation, it was intended to spin off by January of 2024, we worked with Deed to make sure that they had a plan to spin it off. I'm extremely disappointed that now we're going and creating a full-fledged agency, uh, a sub-agency under this. That was never the intention. The intention was to seed an organization that would uh, help make Minnesota a, a technological and innovative hub. And I'm afraid that as a government agency, um, and, and, and I'm not saying that there wouldn't have always been some sort of uh, tie, right, to that, uh, to that organization that we, we wouldn't be supporting it with grant money like we do a number of organizations. But the fact that we've gone so far away from the original intent uh, concerns me. And then when we talk about the $5 million grant for the uh, automotive component, um, I continue to be concerned with how broad that language is. A grant to a Minnesota-based automotive component manufacturer specializing in electric vehicles and sensor technology. This is a one-time appropriation. 
no explanation why these funds are being provided. Um, this is a, a, a venture that's being uh, seeded by a multi-million dollar venture capitalist. Um, and again, who's to say that this grant's not going to be used to acquire property turned around and sold with instant equity? Who's to, we don't know if we're seeding this organization for operating expenses. That's, this is uh, such a broad-based uh, appropriation. It just, it really concerns me, uh, Mr. Chair. So those are a few of the things. Um, I appreciate Senator Champion's um, work on the bill. I know, I know from experience that it's, it's not an easy bill to put together, but it's, it's actually a fun bill to put together. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think he, I appreciate the partnership he and I have uh, developed over the last five years uh, working together, um, each of us, each of us in each other's roles, so to speak. Um, but I, I do want to thank Senator Champion for his, his, uh, his focus on making sure that there is something for every corner of the state uh, in the bill. And while we may disagree on, on the details, we may disagree on, on some of the approaches overall, Senator Champion, I, I, I do recognize um, your effort to, to try to be fair. And Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, what I will say is uh, uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, for uh, your comments and just our continued uh, uh, working relationship and personal, too. I love to talk to you about sports, too. So, of course, that's a part of it. And we both lost bad when we think in terms of March Madness. I guess we share that together, too. But I do want to just thank you for your continued work. And, and I was there watching as he was putting together Main Street and understood from his banking perspective and care perspective why he did some of the things that he, uh, why he put forth some of the uh, uh, eligibility notions that he did. And, and it helped some people. And, and where there's limits, and, and, and I know in communities of color that capital is always an issue, right? And so it's difficult sometimes to come up with 50% in order to get the help that you need. And so that's why we also worked on making sure that, that it, it was the right organizations to do this work, but also provide the technical assistance that's important and how do we get into the bowels of these communities and help make things work. Um, and I am appreciative of everything that I say I, I, I want you to know that it, it includes a cross-section of folks from our vice chair to our committee administrator to our staff. Everyone has worked together, especially these two ladies sitting next to me as well, to, to, to try to figure out and dissect what I really mean by something. So I know that's a, that's a chore, okay? Um, launch Minnesota. Uh, that's something that I know was, you know, has always been uh, near and dear to you. I know that you were thinking about it spinning off, and we thought we were codified in order to make sure that your wonderful intent or the intentions behind it would uh, somehow continue to make Minnesota better. Uh, Main Street, you and I talked about how do we continue that, and I did say that I, I would certainly, you know, think about all these things, whether it's, you know, wh um, how we can give some additional support but also what are those things that we can gravitate to. And we'll continue to explore language like what you talked about, the automotive component notion. How do we strengthen that and make sure that it's, it's really focused and thoughtful and, 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 and it protects us? So, um, so language and making sure that there's no, this notion about jobs because we know this clearly about jobs, but we want to make sure that the language lines up with that. And the last thing that I'll say before I answer any other questions is that when you have experienced uh, intentional disinvestment sometime and you've been disenfranchised, it, it's pretty hard sometimes to think about, you know, how do you move to the next uh, 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 place or next level without having some infusion or some injection of support, right? And how we do that and be responsible. And I think that we put forth uh, we have a bill before you that does all those things to, you know, be as thoughtful as possible. Is there always room for improvement? Absolutely. And we're going to strive to be better tomorrow than we were today. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, as I indicated earlier, we're Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Champion. I do have a few more, or I do have a couple of questions. Uh, 
Senator Pratt brought up about this uh, Minnesota-based automotive component <coughs> manufacturer. So has it been decided who that person, who that organization is going to be, or is this going to be put out in RFPs? Is this going to be a grant process that people apply for grants and you choose the one that's the most adequate? Can you tell me where that's at at this point? So, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. It, 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 there is a specific organization that we are thinking about or thought about, and that organization came in and presented. It's called FlexForge. It's in Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park area, and it's directly connected to jobs. The one thing that Senator Pratt says uh, that we will do is make sure that we tighten up, up the language, but it's about jobs and manufacturing jobs for electric vehicle components. Because one of the things that we've talked a lot about is a number of our components uh, are manufactured someplace else, and, and how do we bring them back and really create this robust opportunity, not just for livable wage jobs, but, but put us in a position strategically as a nation so that we're uh, not as dependent on, on others. Follow-up, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Uh, so did you have other potential manufacturers come in and interview them and see what their process would be? Um, uh, Mr. Chair and to Senator Dames, yes. How many so, did you I'm sorry. follow up, Mr. Chair? So can you give me some idea how many other folks you invited in to interview or have them do a hearing on this process as far as making these circuit breakers, circ whatever you're calling them? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Mr. Chair, so we uh, sent out a wide net, right, uh, so that, you know, different folks, including but not limited to semiconductors, uh, when we think in terms of the CHIPS Act, BioMade, you know, um, just a cross-section of folks. So, um, but again, even from a competitive perspective, we still are making sure that the Minnesota Forward Fund has money in it as well. So if there are others who did not come in, we don't want them to, to be excluded from the opportunity to present and, and uh, get some resources. A follow-up, Mr. Chair? So is there there's some reason that this company needs the money to support this? Are they not sufficient? Uh, have they been doing this in the past? Are they new on the block? Tell me a little about the business and, and why we need to be funding them. If they're a successful business, I wouldn't think we would have to. And if they're not a successful business, I would question why we would be investing. So, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames, I'm not quite sure I would agree with your notion because we've supported a number of businesses that have been successful and needed some support to get to the next level, whether that's uh, um, uh, the, um, and I can't remember the name of that business in northern Minnesota where it was, uh, uh, yeah, Cirrus in, in Duluth, right? There's been a number of, of organizations and businesses that we've supported because we wanted them to go to, uh, 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 to the next uh, step because that was the paper plan. And we wanted to make sure that they could continue to make sure that they have jobs and opportunity. So that's why I disagree with the notion that we don't do that and that's a sign of success or not. We want to make sure that we support businesses, that they're able to um, uh, bring on another line of, of, of staff um, and, and, and those who are able to be a part of the manufacturing plant and for that there, so that there's livable wage jobs, so they're fa family sustaining wages. Uh, so uh, we will continue to do that. So this is about this, this organization. They want to uh, in increase their number of employees. Uh, we want to make sure that we bring those manufacturing jobs from uh, Europe and other places back into Minnesota. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So I'm assuming then you're going to set this up so they have to have benchmarks that they meet in order to get the money. And if they don't meet those benchmarks, any money they've got, they'll have to refund back to the state. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chair and to Senator Dames, Absolutely, there would be benchmarks. In fact, you heard the department talk about it's reimbursable. So they have to show some things and do some things before they can even get the money. So absolutely, Senator Dames. Uh, well, I, well, thank you, uh, Senator Champion. I appreciate the information. I don't agree with this process and the way this has come about, but uh, thank you for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Senator Muhammad. I'll be short and quick because I think we want to move the bill, but I just wanted to 
kind of touch on um, a little bit of what Senator Friends talked about earlier, and I think this bill actually addresses all the concerns that you may or may not have had. We, as Senator Champion, took a, re a lot of time to ensure that not only did we touch on the businesses that were in Greater Minnesota and the organizations that needed help, but he wanted to think about it from an equitable perspective for businesses that were owned by veterans and women. And, you know, as somebody who represents Lake Street, the area that was hit the hardest during the civil unrest, um, often those businesses, they don't have lobbyists walking around and talking to us. They're the mom and pop shops that are struggling the most as well, even though I'm from Minneapolis. And and I think he did a really good job of making sure that's reflected in, in the Promise Act. And I think um, this is a really good, well-rounded bill. A lot of our uh, members from uh, the Republican Party, their um, projects that were hurt, all of them are included. And I think that's to say the fact that this is a bill, whether it will get bipartisan support or not, it is a bipartisan bill because it does have bipartisan support, bipartisan projects. So just wanted to echo that and say thank you, Senator Champion, for putting together a good bill. If there's no further discussion, as I indicated, we are going to lay this bill over so we can fold in the, the labor omnibus bill, which we will take up next. So Senator Champion moves to lay over Senate file 3035 as amended to lay it on the table. That's there, my amendment. Uh, that's my motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. And Senate file 3035 is laid on the table, and we're going to move next to Senate file 2782, Senator McEwen, and that bill is now being handed out in the packet with all the notes and everything. Thank you, Senator Champion and, and Ms. Doyle Fontaine and Ms. Ms. Grunewald Mogner and all the other staff and Senator Champions and other offices on that. While we're getting this handed out and preparing for the switch over to the new bill, uh, two housekeeping items. One, I've seen some of the bills are like this thick. If anybody wants a hard copy of them when we're in committee, uh, when they're too big to staple, I think a lot of us, not only is it a lot of paper, but a lot of us have trouble moving them and not mixing them. If you want the hard copy, please contact Elspeth to make sure we have them prepared. Otherwise, um, I'll start bringing my computer down because when you get to that thick of bills, it's a lot easier to work with the computer, I think. But let, let the staff know if you have a desire to have those super big bills printed out for you for a committee. And then the second housekeeping item is we are not going to have finance committee before the floor session tomorrow. We're not going to be doing the health and human services tomorrow, just the legacy bill, which we will take up after the session. Um, and with that, Senator McEwen, welcome to the Senate Finance Committee with Senate File 2782. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Pleased to be here. And if you want to present and then um, we can go through the uh, budget page then after that. So Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I'll just offer some very brief comments and, and then um, we can uh, ask our... Um, professionals here to go th work through the financials with us and, and review the, the bill and then um, proceed to some discussion. I also have a couple of um, sort of technical amendments um, that I'll bring as well. Members, this is a bill that we're very proud of. It comes out of work um, this session in the Labor Committee that has been driven and led by Minnesota's workers showing up and um, bringing the issues that, many issues that people have been working on for years and um, are, are ready for us to act on those issues and those concerns to move forward. So the Senate File 2782 is, of, of course, as you know, the Senate Omnibus Labor Budget Bill for this session. Uh, the bill funds the Department of Labor and Industry, the Bureau of Mediation Services, and the Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals. Um, and as I said, it coming out of workers really showing up for our committee and um, bringing the, their issues. The, the bill does contain a number of, um, of bills. Um, 
everything from setting new labor standards related to food processing work, um, nursing homes, and regulating restrictive employment and contracting agreements, um, a, a number of bills that we included in the omnibus, including the duty to defend bill. Um, we have a helmets to hard hats appropriation. That's um, Senator Mitchell's bill. Um, really pragmatic things like installation requiring um, requirement for adult size changing facilities in restrooms that are accessible to the public. That was a bill that um, Senator Bolden brought. Um, some provisions um, addressing sexual harassment settlements or abuse settlements uh, and prohibiting them from being paid out as severance um, so that they would not be taxed. Um, energy code adoption modifications for new commercial buildings, prevailing wage um, um, requirements, career pathways program, um, the Minnesota um, nurse, I, I, I already referred to the nursing home, but it, the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board Act is Senator Pappas's bill also included. And um, uh, the a provision to include claims against solar installers, which we're going to have more and more of, into the contractor recovery fund, which is an issue that um, one of my constituents had brought to me um, initially when I was elected a couple of years ago. So a lot of pragmatic uh, provisions in this bill and also notable from the government, governor's budget in this bill is a uh, very exciting um, uh, setup for an ergonomics division in, the, in Minnesota OSHA to modernize how we're going to approach workplace injuries in Minnesota. We heard a lot of testimony about those types of injuries and, and um, very exciting work that we're... Um, that the commissioner of uh, the Department of Labor and Industry and their staff are about to embark on in regard to the ergonomics division. And, and additionally, uh, from the governor's budget, we have funding for clean energy, uh, clean economy, apprenticeships to transition our workforce to those good family supporting jobs um, that are a part of our transition to uh, a green energy future. So a lot of really good pieces to this bill, a lot of work put into it by a lot of people. And with that, Mr. Chair, members, I'll um, hand it over to our um, wonderful staff who are two of the people who have put in a lot of work to make this bill what Senator it is. Senator McEwen, did you want to adopt the technical amendments first or did you rather go through the bill first? Um, I may, Mr. Chair, let's see. I, it, it may be helpful to have um, the staff go through actually the A22 amendment um, because the, the changes are, um, it's the A, I have an A22 and then the A25. Can and start we, with we the could, A22? Yeah, okay, um, thank you. Senator Friends moves to A22. Mr. Olofsson, you want to go through the, the amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Eric Olofsson, uh, Senate Fiscal Analyst. Um, so for the A22 amendment, uh, it rebalances the bill after a revenue estimate came in regarding Senate File 1258. Uh, there needed to be a $100,000 per fiscal year adjustment. So I'll talk about that specific line item on the amendment. It also makes technical and clarifying changes and a couple other changes that Ms. Doyle Fontaine will also discuss. So lines 1.2 through 1.9 just adjust the overall appropriation amounts based off of this rebalancing. Um, lines 1.10 through 115 uh, through 116 of the amendment are technical and uh, conforming changes for the amendment just for consistent language. Uh, lines 1.17 through 1.18 is where the $100,000 of general fund per fiscal year changes are decreased. So this is f uh, for a transfer to the AG of uh, the Attorney General's office. This is decreased by 100000 per fiscal year. Uh, for the construction workers wage protection enforcement that was that's transferred to the Attorney General's office. Uh, for lines 1.19 through um, 1.23, that's more technical and conforming changes. Uh, and then 1.24 uh, through 214, that's a reporting requirement for the Career Pathways Program that was in the original bill of Senate File 1599, but was erroneously uh, for, 
left out of the omnibus bill. So it's being re-added to the bill. And then 215 and 216 are more technical and conforming changes. And then I'll let Ms. Doyle Fontaine handle the rest. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Then on the amendment at line 217, this adds a citation to a string of employment law sections, and this includes this, this string of citations in within the compliance orders that the Department of Labor and Industry is able to enforce. And then on line 2.19, this adds uh, some clarifying lang language that is specific to the section that's prohibiting non-compete agreements. This is within the choice of law and venue subdivision, and it clarifies that the subdivision on choice of law and venue, venue only applies to claims arising uh, under this section, which is particular to um, the prohibition on non-competes. And that is the Is the there amendment. any discussion on the A22 amendment? Senator Drehan. Thank you, Chair Marty. I, I just had a question on, on the amendment on line 1.25 um, through 1.27. Why is the one school district called out? Is, is it can maybe nonpartisan or, or someone explain why that is there? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, members, I, first of all, this, this was um, language that was, was part of the bill and this was uh, included in last year's bill, not that that matters, but I believe this uh, school district is the one that is going to be running running the program, so that's why they're called out. Thank you. Further discussion on A22, if not all those in favor say, uh, Senator Frenzy's amendment, I believe. Okay. Yes. okay. <laughs> if all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator McEwen, you said you had an A25 as well? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Is that, here it's being distributed now. You can explain it, it just simply deletes section three on page 70. So Ms. Doyle Fontaine or whoever. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, this would delete a section in the bill that is particular to settlements received um, in se sexual harassment claims. And this provision would have allowed a subtraction uh, for uh, those claims um, from the for a tax subtraction and right now um, w it's not within the the budget or the target for to for, to have the bill carry this so right now that uh, labor chair is having it removed for that reason I believe and Senator McEwen if if I might here we actually still have it in the budget mm -hmm. yes oh. so we, yeah if I could, I'll just add a little, a little bit of detail. That is almost uh, my understanding um, is that um, that is correct. We've been advised um, that it would be inappropriate for us to carry a tax, something that is tax implicated in policy in our bill. So I am in discussion with Senator Rest right now um, for Senator Rest to look at carrying this section, which we are deleting, but we are carrying the appropriation as part of our bill. Okay, so, so the appropriation is still in the bill, but but because it's tax policy, she would be the one. Okay. Correct. Is there further discussion on the A25 amendment also offered by Senator Friends? Okay. Not all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, Mr. Olofsson, you want to go through the spreadsheet now or? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. In your packets, you should find a spreadsheet titled uh, Senate, Senate Labor Budget Omnibus Finance, um, Senate File 2782, First Engrossment Assuming Adoption of the A22 Amendment. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you should see 1.52 p.m. Um, so just to orient you towards the spreadsheet, the left side of the spreadsheet uh, talks about which department, agencies and departments uh, and the specific riders within the bill. It also describes what funds uh, these different appropriations are coming from. Columns A through C describe the biennial bases. So column A is fiscal year 22, 23, the current biennium. Then B and C are the biennial base totals. Uh, columns D through G uh, describe the governor's revised budget recommendations. And then where we'll focus today is from columns H through K, uh, specifically on columns I and K, which are the changes over the base um, for this budget bill. So just to orient you overall, the 
base general fund spending uh, for the labor uh, for the labor is 11, approximately 11.5 million for the 24-25 biennium and 11.5 million for the 26-27 biennium. Uh, the labor omnibus bill was given a target of 8 million of general fund spending no, for the 24-25 biennium and 6.5 million uh, in the tails of general fund spending. So um, the columns on the right hand side highlighted in blue are the change items that I'll walk through today. There are also certain columns highlighted in yellow uh, that are bills that are traveling separately. And so- Unfortunately in ours they're gray in both cases. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so, so just I'll, the highlighted I'll, ones, okay. I'll definitely uh, inform you which ones are traveling separately um, and just to go over those for you. So just to, to begin here, uh, so we'll start with the Department of Labor and Industry, uh, looking at uh, row six here in column I, we have approximately 1.1 million of additional general, of. this is from the Workers' Compensation Fund of 1.1 million for maintaining current service levels in the 24-25 biennium, and 1.45 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, and for technology services reorganization, this is on row seven uh, in the workers' compensation fund. This is approximately 6.1 million in the 24-25 biennium and 6.24 million in the 26-27 biennium. Um, moving on, so for a total additional spending from the workers' compensation fund on line 11 of 7.2 uh, million in the 24-25 biennium, and 7.7 .7 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, moving on down, so this is for the workforce development initiatives within the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, moving on down to the Youth Skills Training Program. This is from the Workforce Development Fund. There's an additional 1.5 million uh, of additional spending in the 24-25 biennium and 1.5 million of additional spending in the 26-27 biennium. And then for the Career Pathways Program, uh, this is the transfer to the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, this is on line, tw line 24. This is also from the Workforce Development Fund, um, and it's 300,000 of one time, uh, 300,000 one time transfer in fiscal year 24. So for looking at uh, line 28, that's a, for the 24-25 biennium, that's 1.8 million uh, from the Workforce Development Fund of additional spending above the base. And then for the 26-27 biennium, it's 1.5 million from the Workforce Development Fund. Moving on to page two, um, we're, this is the, Department of Labor, uh, this is the Labor Standards Division within the Department of, within DLI. So looking at line 36 for, this is nursing and lactating mother's leave uh, for the WISA outreach or uh, the Women's Economic Security Act outreach. Uh, so this is all, this is from the general fund. This is 476,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 484,000 above the base in the 26-27 biennium. On line 38, to maintain current service levels for the Labor Standards Division, uh, from the general fund, it's 393,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 492,000 in the 26-27 biennium. On line 39, uh, for the safety and well-being of agricultural and food processing workers from the general fund, uh, it's 326,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 284,000 above base in the 26-27 biennium. On line 41, for the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, this is for board creation rulemaking from the general fund. It's approximately 1 million, uh, a little over 1 million in the 24-25 biennium and 761,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, and then in li on line 42, uh, this is also for the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board. Um, in the governor's recommendations, uh, they acknowledged a, a cost to the DHS 
of 69,000 fiscal year 27. So while the bill doesn't appropriate directly for this currently in the current bill, it acknowledges that cost within the target. Um, on line 43, for the safe workplaces for meat and poultry processing workers, um, there is, um, from the general fund, it's 394,000 above base in 24-25 and 338,000 in the 26-27 biennium. And uh, for enforcement, uh, for the safe workplaces for meat and poultry processing workers, as a transfer to the Attorney General's office, it's 383,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 276,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, so the qualifying damages tax subtraction, this is the administration part. There's a transfer to the Minnesota Department of Revenue. This is on line 45. Uh, this is also general fund spending of 84,000 above the base in 24-25 uh, and 50,000 above the base in 26-27. On line 46, uh, for the construction worker wage protection, uh, this is a transfer to the Attorney General's Office for enforcement. After the adoption of the amendment, it is 150,000 above the base in the 24-25 biennium and 150,000 above the base in the 26-27 biennium. Um, and now looking at the direct appropriations from the Workforce Development Fund, uh, on line four. On line 49, for prevailing wage enforcement, uh, this is for education and compliance. There's an additional two point, approximately 2.9 million for the 24-25 biennium, and uh, again, approximately 2.97 million in the 26-27 biennium. Again, this is from the Workforce Development Fund. Um, this part gets a little complicated because uh, the bill separates, uh, it was the labor standards and apprenticeship division. The bill separates it into the labor standards division and the apprenticeship division within DLI. So, but just for the maintaining current service levels uh, with it, for the apprenticeship division, there's 180,000 from the Workforce Development Fund in the 24-25 biennium. This is on line 50 and 242,000 in the 26-27 biennium. And here's where we see that transfer to that new apprenticeship division, uh, or at least the first part of it. Uh, on line 51, we see the transfer of two or 2.7 million from the Workforce Development Fund from this uh, division within uh, DLI. Uh, and then we see another 2.78 million in 26-27. So for the labor standards total appropriations for, for the general fund, uh, you see an additional spending on line 53 of 3.2 million in 24-25 and 2.9 million in 26-27. And from the workforce development fund of 354,000 in 24-25 and 426,000 in 26-27. So moving on to page three, here's where we see that new apprenticeship division. Um, so here's the transfer on line 57 of the 2.7 million in, in workforce development fund of, in fiscal year 24-25 and 2.78 million in 26-27. Um, on line 58, we see the growing clean economy apprenticeships. Um, that's $3 million from the workforce development fund in one-time uh, spending in fiscal year 24. Uh, on line 59 for LEAP grants, uh, so ex to expand equity and apprenticeship, for, this is from the Workforce Development Fund. It's approximately 2.1 million above the base in fiscal year 24-25 and 2.1 million above the base in fiscal year 20, in the 26-27 biennium. On line 61, we see the Helmets to Hard Hats program. Um, this is also from the Workforce Development Fund, it's 450,000 above base in the 24-25 biennium and 450,000 above the base in the 26-27 biennium. So on line 62, we see a total uh, spending above base uh, for the Workforce Development Fund um, of 8.25 million in 24-25 and 5.32 million in 26-27 biennium. Uh, now, working 
moving on to the workplace safety division within DLI. Uh, for the Minnesota OSHA, uh, this is on line 65. For the Minnesota OSHA regulation of ergonomic injuries, this is for safety grants. This is from the general fund. It's approximately 1.26 million in one time spending in fiscal year 24. And then the direct appropriations from the workers' compensation fund within the workplace safety division, looking at line 67. So this is from the workers' compensation fund. This is 720,000 above the base in 24, 25 biennium and 966,000 above the base in the 26, 27 biennium. And then for, uh, going for the Minnesota OSHA regulation of ergonomic injuries, this is for staffing, education, outreach, and tech. Uh, this is from the Workers' Compensation Fund. This is 1.6 million in the 24-25 biennium of additional spending and 2.7 million in the 26-27 biennium. Then line 69, this is one of those uh, bills that are traveling separately. This is Senate File 58. Uh, the warehouse distribution, this is for warehouse distribution worker safety. This is traveling, and again, this bill is traveling separately. It's 458,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 436,000 in the 26-27 biennium. So uh, looking at the omnibus bill plus all, uh, plus the bills traveling separately for the general fund on line 71, we see the 1.3 million of additional spending in in uh, fiscal year 20, in the 24-25 biennium, and then for the total workers' compensation fund, this is on line 72. It's uh, 2.78 million in the 24-25 biennium and 3.9 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, and then, so for a total additional spending, this is on line 75 of four, approximately 4.04 million in the 24-25 biennium and 3. Point uh, approximately 3.9 million in the 26, 27 biennium. So moving on to line, uh, not line, page four. Senator Champion, right now. Oh. Senator Champion, did you have a question right now? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll wait until he's finished because I have some questions about the pressure that's being put on the Workforce Development Fund, which seems to be outside of, of, of the target. Go ahead, Mr. Okay. Wilson. Yep. Okay, so moving on to page four. Um, uh, we are now in the general support division within uh, DLA, uh, looking at line 80 for maintaining current service levels. There's an additional f approximately 4.6 million in the 26, 27 biennium and 4.9 million of additional spending in the um, 26, 27 biennium. This is from the workers' compensation fund. And then for on, on line 81, for technology services reorganization, there's 1.2 million in the 24-25 biennium of additional spending and 1.27 million in the 26-27 biennium. Again, this is from the workers' compensation fund. Um, so for a total additional spending looking uh, for the general support division, looking on line 85 of approximately 5.8 million in the 24-25 biennium and 6.1 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, moving on down to the new office of combative sports uh, on line 88, uh, we see uh, this is general fund spending of 497,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 508,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Um, looking, so now we see the total, uh, total direct appropriations from the Department of Labor and Industry of four point, of general fund spending of 4.98 million in the 24-25 biennium and 3.4 million in the 26-27 biennium. From the workers' compensation fund, this is on line 93. Uh, we see this, so this includes the bills traveling separately and what's in the omnibus bill of 15.7 million in the 24 25 biennium and 17.8 million in the 26 27 biennium of additional spending above the base. And then on line 95 from the Workforce Development Fund. Uh, with DLI, we see a total additional spending of 10.4 million in the 24-25 biennium and 7.29 million in the 26-27 biennium. 
uh, for a total additional direct appropriations of, thir this is on line 98, of, of 31.1 million in the 24-25 biennium and 28.5 million in the 26-27 biennium. Moving on to page five, uh, we see the statutory and open appropriation changes within uh, DLI. So I will focus here on the, uh, starting on line 102 on page five. So the Office of Combative Sports has a special revenue f uh, account within the special revenue fund. Uh, you'll notice when I also talk about new revenues, it, uh, th th these amounts match up. So there's additional $30,000 dollars of spending in the 24-25 biennium and 30000 in the 26-27 biennium uh, for the Office of Combative Sports and the Special Revenue Fund. Um, moving on down to line 104 for the climate sub-cabinet for uh, commercial energy code. It's $100,000 of one-time spending from the construction codes fund in fiscal year 24. Um, for on line 105 for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, it's 163,000 from the construction code fund uh, of one, to, uh, so 163,000 in fiscal year 24 of one time spending. Uh, on line 106 for existing buildings energy efficiency, this is spending from the construction codes fund of 406,000 in fiscal year 24, uh, again, one time costs. Uh, for on line 107, safe housing for elderly and vulnerable adults. Uh, so this adds like assisted living uh, venues. This is from the governor's recommendations to with to licensing within the construction code fund within the construction codes of. Uh, so that's an additional spending from the construction code fund of 429,000 in the fiscal year in the 24-25 biennium and a million 28,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, on line 108 for window cleaning safety, uh, this is another governor's rec and this is primarily for rulemaking. Uh, so from the construction codes fund, this is $193,000 of one-time spending in fiscal year 24. Uh, on line 109 for adult size changing facilities rulemaking, uh, this is uh, uh, from Senate file 999 from the construction code. Uh, there's $47,000 of one time spending in fiscal year 24. So on line 111, so for a total statutory and open appropriation changes of 1.4 million of additional spending in the 24-25 biennium and 1.2 million in the 26-27 biennium. Um, and now moving on down to new revenues um, and uh, within the bill. Uh, so, and there's a couple that, of the bills that are traveling separately. So on line 113, uh, so for the Minnesota OSHA federal maximum penalty conformity, this is from the workers' compensation fund. Uh, there is a, 251,000 of additional revenue in the 24-25 biennium and 261,000 in the 26-27 biennium. On line 114, for prevailing wage compliance, uh, anticipated revenues to the general fund uh, through DLI are 36,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 50,000 in the 26-27 biennium. On line 115, this is the Combative Sports Health and Safety Improvements. This is the amounts that match up in the Special Revenue Fund. It's $30,000 in the 24-25 biennium and $30,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Um, for the Construction Code Fund, uh, this also matches up with, uh, this is on line 116 for safe housing for elderly and vulnerable adults. This also matches with line 107, uh, so it anticipates 429,000 of revenue coming in in fiscal year in the 24-25 biennium into the construction code fund and 1. Point, and 1.028 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, for the Safe and Skilled Worker Act, this is Senate File 10 regarding petroleum uh, facilities uh, for penalty collection. In the general fund, there's $10,000 of anticipated penalty collection in the 24-25 biennium and 10,000 to the general fund in the 26-27 biennium. 
And then for the warehouse distribution worker safety, this is Senate file 58 that's also traveling separately uh, to the workers' compensation fund. There's 26,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 26,000 revenue in the 26-27 uh, biennium. Um, and then on line 119, uh, for construction code and license fee reimbursements and reductions, uh, it's fourth. It's a reduction in revenue of 4,000 in the 24-25 biennium. This is to the construction code fund, and a reduction of 4,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, so. On line 120, for Senate file 207, uh, estimated re revenue from the Attorney General's office for litigation. Uh, this is for meat and poultry processing workers. It's uh, Senator Putnam's bill. Uh, in, general, uh, in the general fund, um, we're anticipating 50,000. Uh, the bill anticipates 50,000 of additional revenue in the 24-25 biennium and 50,000 in the 26-27 biennium. And then on line 121, uh, we are still, uh, the bill still assumes uh, the qualifying ta damages tax subtraction. So this is the Minnesota Department of, or the target still assumes the loss of revenue to the Department of Revenue for Senate file 1258 uh, of 200,000 loss to the general fund in the 24-25 biennium and $200,000 to the general fund in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, so on line 122 for total revenues, it's um, 628,000 uh, of additional revenue in, uh, in the 24-25 biennium and 1.25 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, on page six, I'll just focus on the net appropriations overall um, as I've gone through the appropriations and new revenue overall. But starting on line uh, 139 for DLI, um, so for the general fund, it's five point, approximately 5.1 million of net spending in the 24-25 biennium and 3.5 million in the 26-27 biennium. Um, on, for the workers' compensation fund on line 140, it's 15.45 million in the 24-25 biennium and 17.5 million in the 26-27 biennium. For the workforce development fund, it's approximately 10.4 million in the 24-25 biennium and 7.3 million in the 26-27 biennium. And then on, for line 143, the construction codes fund, it's additional 913,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 150,000 in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, on page seven, we move on to the Bureau of Mediation Services. Um, so looking at line 150, the Public Employee Relations Board planning, this is Senate file 303 and is traveling separately. Um, it's 1.5 million of additional spending in the 24-25 biennium and 1.5 million in the 26-27 biennium. And then to maintain current service levels for the Bureau of uh, mediation services. This is from the general fund. It's 1.4 million in the 26-27 biennium and approximately 1.5 million in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, for a total uh, appropriation, total general fund change of appropriations on line 156 of 2.9 million in the 24-25 biennium and approximately approximately 3 million in the 26-27 biennium. And then moving on to the Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals. Uh, for maintaining current service levels, this is on line 165. Uh, it's 480,000 in the 24-25 biennium and 560,000 in the 26-27 biennium. And then for rulemaking, it, also from the Workers' Compensation Fund, it's $100,000 in the 24-25 biennium. So the total appropriations for the Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals, all from the Workers' Compensation Fund, is 580000 above the base in the 24-25 biennium and $560,000 above the base in the 26-27 biennium. Then moving on to our last page uh, for... Um, looking, I'll again look at the net totals by fund. So on line 178, you will see that 
um, for the general fund, uh, Senate file 2782 as amended with the 822 amendment uh, meets the additional spending target of $8 million in the fiscal year 24-25 biennium and $6.5 million of additional general fund spending in the 26-27 biennium. On line 179 for the Workforce Development Fund, it's an additional $10.4 million uh, of additional spending above base in the 24-25 biennium and $7.3 million in the 26-27 biennium. On line 180 for the Workers' Compensation Fund, it's additional $16.03 million, .03 million in the 24-25 biennium and $18.07 in the 26-27 biennium. And then moving on down to line 183 for the Construction Codes Fund, it's 913,000 of additional spending in the 24-25 biennium and 150,000 in the 26-27 biennium. So for all funds, uh, the net change or net change is 35,375,000. This is on line 185 and 32,000 and, uh, oh, sorry, 35 million and 375 in the 24-25 biennium and 32 million and 5,000 in the 26-27 biennium. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions or, or I can move in to discussing Article 1. Thank you, Mr. Wolfson. Thank you, Mr. Wolfson. Um, if there are no questions right now, we can go into just continue on in Article 1 then. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a couple sure. questions. Oh, sure. Senator Champion. Thank you. I'm sorry that I was away, and so I didn't have an opportunity to, to ask my question of the uh, fiscal analyst. Can you tell me how much money, when you aggregate it, that you are spending from the Workforce Development Fund mm -hmm. for this biennium, and then how much, when you aggregate it all, are you spending in the tails? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So when you aggregate it all, including additional revenues to the Workforce Development Fund? From, from only the Workforce Development Fund. Okay. Um, so the additional, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the additional spending, as you can see on line 170 and line uh, 179, this is on page 8 of your spreadsheet, Looking at columns I, uh, it's 10.432 million in the 24-25 biennium. Uh, which line? Uh, are you looking at line 170? Yeah. Yep, 170 column K. Yep. So it's 10.432 million in the 24-25 biennium. And then can you tell me what the target is uh, for the uh, labor committee? Sure. Sure, I, I can, Senator Champion, what I had said, we didn't, what I had suggested with that was that we stick where the government, I wanted to protect the Workforce Development Fund, and and I knew your committee and Senator McEwen's committee both had provisions in there from the governor's provision, and, um, and I had suggested to the two of you that we either do the governor's split or the two of you work out something different so we protect the fund. And <clears throat> Senator McEwen had said she had the helmets to hard hats thing which was above what the governor spent in there, so his was oh, I won something, I won 9.7, and about the difference was was helmets to hard hats, I believe, and yours was, you were not spending anywhere near that. I reached out to the two of you and tried to get, see if there's any problems with that. So, uh, uh, I, Mr. Chair, I got no email from you. I, and and it's my understanding that what you, what you all are doing now is that I'd like for you to tell us what the target is, sure. because what you're doing is that you're circumventing the target. Mr. Senator Champion, I called you and called Senator McEwen several times trying to make sure that we weren't going to be overspending out of that account. And, and to me, the numbers, I can't remember, I don't have your spreadsheet in front of me, but to me, the governor was proposing to spend about, but maybe Mr. Nauman has what the governor was going to spend in, in each budget and what, what was here in the two budgets here. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll endeavor to help a little bit here, and maybe I've, if you'll permit me to analyze this in a slightly different 
perspective. Um, <clears throat> the February forecast for the Workforce Development Fund projects a budgetary balance, so a bottom line in the fund in 24 and 25 of 76,447 million dollars. In 26 and 27, the balance is projected to be 127,034. The combined Senate position for the uh, the two bills spends 63. I, I'm sorry. Uh, the the jobs bill spends 2266 in 24 and 25. That's 2.266 million. The labor bill spends 10,432. So if you subtract those from the balance in 24 and 25, that leaves a budgetary balance in the the Workforce Development Fund of 63,749. And if you do that same math, um, in 26 and 27, there's 119.64. The governor, and this is why I ask your indulgence, I didn't check the governor's actual spending, but I can tell you the governor's budgetary balance for these two combined areas is 11,684, which compares to the 63 in the unified Senate position and 45,328 compared to 119.64 in the two bills unified together. And so, uh, 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 Mr. Norman, tell me what is the target for labor? So, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, when you're talking about the target, are you speaking about the general fund target for, for, for this committee? That's what I'm speaking about because uh, workforce development fund is not a part of that target, and what you're doing is you're circumventing the the target. Um, Senator Champion, I I would read it differently. We gave them general fund targets, and what we were at what I was asking for is how we're going to protect, because I understood there were multiple claims for a workforce development fund, and I suggest we not go over what the governor was spending, and between the governor's spending and then in the two departments, in the two bills in effect, not two departments, in the two bills, and the spending that you and Senator McEwen were proposing um, was significantly lower in the combined. So the goal of preserving the Workforce Development Fund so the money can go to the Job Skills Partnership was much less in the House and Senate bills, excuse me, the Senate, the two Senate bills, because your bill was not using much of it, and hers was about a half million over what the governor was spending in his because of the Helmets to Hard Hats proposal. Uh, Mr. Chair, in an effort not to keep going okay. down this road, because I will, I, I suggest that we take a recess and have a conversation. Uh, with that, this we'll take a 10-minute recess.
This meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come back to order. Mr. Olofsson had finished the walkthrough, and Ms. Fontaine Doyle was going to go through the language, or you were in beginning to do that. Mr. Chair, members, I, I can walk quickly through the, the articles that correspond with the spreadsheet that Mr. Olson just went through. So beginning on page seven, that's where article two starts. This, uh, is, amend, this section or this article amends three areas of worker protection laws, the Packing House Worker, Workers' Bill of Rights, migrant labor laws, and recruitment and food, food processing employment protection. So there are various definition changes and some other language that increases worker protections in these particular areas of law. Then Article 3 is the contents of six, uh, Senator Pappas' bill, and this article establishes the Minnesota Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board. Then uh, Article 4 is on page 28 of this first engrossment of Senate File 2782. This combative sports article modifies terminology and makes other changes regarding uh, the combative sports, which is under the jurisdiction of the Commissioner of Labor and Industry. So there, like I said, there are some um, definition changes and some other um, rulemaking uh, authority uh, changes and just some other sort of housekeeping changes to go along with combative sports, which hasn't had a bill in a, in a number of years, so there was quite a bit of work to be done in, in this article. Then Article 5 begins on page 41. Uh, the first section, uh, this is a miscellaneous article with uh, miscellaneous provisions in it. The first section is, uh, is actually a, a section of law in Chapter 116J, which is an economic development section. And this is regarding the prevailing wage requirements for economic development projects. And this uh, section is being carried in the labor bill, but I, as I understand it, um, the, the cost to do the additional work for the Department of, labor, of Employment and Economic Development is being carried in the, in the jobs bill. So I just wanted to point that out. Then there are a number of, of technical, some changes um, that d do involve some costs to the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, in particular, there's a change that's separating the division of apprenticeship um, in uh, creating a separate division of apprenticeship within the Department of Labor and Industry. So there are several sections that, that deal with that. There, you'll also notice um, sections 12 to 17. These are conforming changes to increase OSHA, OSHA penalties to conform to the federal OSHA penalty levels. That is uh, within here. There are a couple of sections on uh, that would require some rulemaking, uh, some building state building code changes. And then over in Article 6, that begins on page 60. This is uh, contents of a Senator Putnam bill. This is uh, another worker protection article for the safe workplaces for meat and poultry pot processing workers. So you'll, this contains a number of sections that uh, uh, would provide work, worker protections and enforcement and compliance, uh, allows that by the Department of Labor and Industry. Then Article 7 begins on page 68. This, uh, this will have two sections as it will leave finance. The first section uh, prohibits payment of, as severance or wages for sexual harassment or abuse settlements. And then the second section prohibits covenants not to compete, that they're void in employment agreements. And then the other section was deleted by the A25 amendment. That was the tax provision that would have allowed a subtraction for damages for sex, sexual har harassment claims. And the last article is Article 8. This begins on page 71. This modifies uh, several provisions that regulate building and construction con contracts, including um, some definition clarifications that are applicable to public contracts as well as uh, private uh, con building and construction contracts. And if you have any questions, um, that concludes my quick walkthrough of the, the articles. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Doyle Fontaine. Is there a questions from the committee? Senator McEwen, you had um, 
both your amendments we adopted, both 25 and 22? Correct. Is there a discussion on the bill? And I had one question in that section, the tax provision on page 70 that we struck. What is the, where in the spreadsheet is that, are we carrying that cost? Uh, just a moment. Uh, on the spreadsheet, uh, Mr. Chair Marty, members of the committee, uh, we are still accounting for the t uh, subtraction of the taxes. This is on line 121 on page 5 of the 200,000 uh, per biennium. So currently the bill still accounts uh, for the tax sub subtraction as Senate file 1258, I believe, is it moving in the tax so, committee. So, so Senator McEwen, Mr. Olofsson, you, in other words, we were tracking the 200, but um, that's the policy of whether to make that tax change will be in tax committee. Okay. Correct. Is there further discussion of the bill? Senator, go ahead, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is uh, and uh, thank you, Senator McEwen. And to your colleagues on the committee uh, who have put this uh, proposal together. And there's a lot in the bill. Um, and I just wanted to call out a couple of things that I think are important and novel um, and either the result of hard work. When I think about the Nursing Home Labor Standards Board, I, I think that's an idea that has been uh, under consideration for some time. And I really like it because we're not just thinking about how we're funding nursing homes, but also thinking about um, how the work is being done. Um, and I know in my work that when we think about how the work is being done, it usually means that the people getting care um, get better care. So I'm excited to see that in here. And then uh, I also want to call out the adult size changing facilities um, proposal um, that is here. And I've heard testimony in a couple of committees, yours and in state government on that proposal. And um, when you hear the people talking about what they're experiencing, it, it surprises me that it's taken this long to get to the point of actually acting on it uh, when we respect the dignity of people, regardless of their physical ability. So I, I know that there's a lot in this bill, um, and I'm, I'm excited to vote for it, but did want to call out those provisions in particular, because I think they're novel and important and uh, show uh, the respect that you have and the committee has and the Senate has for the well-being of people, regardless of age, or regardless of ability. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, Senator McEwen, I, I, I will also call out the warehouse. Senator Dames, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we just took a recess so you folks could figure out the targets. Can you tell me what the targets are for the labor... Uh, Finance omnibus bill. Sure, um, Mr. Nauman or Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chair and um, Senator Dames, the general fund target for the Labor Committee is eight million dollars in uh, fiscal 24-25, and the tail um, target for this budget jurisdiction is six point five million dollars. How much? Six point five. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, I'll try to enunciate a little better. And the jobs bill. Oh, I'm. Uh, the jobs bill is $990 million general fund in fiscal 24-25 and $33 million in fiscal year 26-27. Thank you. Anyway, Senator McEwen, I, the warehouse workers provision and a couple of those worker safety ones I think were highlights for me in the bill. Um, Mr. Chair, we, we, are, we, we are going to... If, Oh, I apologize. Commissioner Wissenbach has been here, and I neglected to call on her. Commissioner, would you like to speak briefly to the committee on the bill? Thank you for being here, and thank you, Senator Pratt.
Welcome to the committee. Please go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator Marty um, and members of the committee. Uh, I wasn't actually expecting to just speak to the bill, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I know a lot of work has went into this bill. I did submit a letter in support of uh, the many provisions in this bill that were included in the governor's budget that we think uh, will go a long way to uh, help working people in the state of Minnesota, uh, help uh, to ensure that the areas uh, that the Department of Labor and Industry has jurisdiction over can function appropriately and do um, everything we want to do and strive to do to uh, respond to the needs of our constituents, our stakeholders at the department. And we are very happy with, uh, with the bill. Thank you. Questions from the committee. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I do want to... Um, I do want to compliment uh, fiscal staff for breaking out the uh, maintaining current service levels. Um, but I do have some questions along those lines. Um, I noticed that in most cases we're looking at about a 5% uh, increase, and there's a couple that, uh, that stick out to me. Um, one is... I can't even read my own writing here, Mr. Chair. Um, the work, uh, I think it's the work comp fund. We're taking a uh, $4,500 um, let me see if I can find that uh, a 4560 increase, which as I, under, as, as I understand it is a 38.5% increase over the 11 million, 11.8 million we've spent in previous years. And I'm just Wondering, it, you know, given that we've talked about, uh, we've talked so much about what, uh, how we should be ad addressing inflation. Um, this, you know, this along with um, uh, a, this one in particular uh, struck stuck out at me, and I'm I'm just wondering if we can get a sense of why we're seeing, and, and that doesn't include the um, uh, the additional million eighty one that I think is also coming out of that same fund. So, Commissioner, can you tell me why the inflationary increases are so high in this area? Commissioner. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt. Um, so, I know there's a number of different things at the department that are funded out of the work comp fund. Um, it includes our workers' compensation division, which I, uh, is the largest uh, division within the department, um, as well as our OSHA uh, compliance uh, division is funded out of the work comp fund. So I think that that's part of it, but I did want to draw attention to one thing, um, which is the general support uh, operating um, that comes out of the work comp fund. So our general support within the department is funded on two two sources. One is the work comp fund, which is an appropriation. The other is done through the other division or other units within the department. Um, and so the increase in, um, and I had to have uh, support on this one, but the two different ways um, include the indirect cost rate, which is how the other divisions pay for general support. That's not done in the workers' compensation division within the department. So we, it looks like a bigger increase percentage-wise than it actually is when you look at the general support that is uh, the full general support budget within the department. I don't know if that makes sense or answers the question, but I'm, I'm happy to answer additional questions. Mr. Pratt. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I would have expected, you know, anything that wasn't directly related. I mean, work comp, the, the amount that's, that's attributable to the work comp system should be going up at the same rate. It shouldn't be going up as a higher rate. It appears that based on your, on your description, uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but how I understood your description is we are subsidizing some of the ongoing cost increases out of the work comp fund and that's what's causing it to look higher. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, no, I, I don't, that's not how I meant to say it if that's how it came across. Um, what I was meaning to say is that 
appropriation that supports general support out of the work comp fund. First of all, it hasn't had an increase in 10 years, um, but that's a static uh, an appropriation. The way that general support is appropriated out of the other divisions is based on uh, the indirect rate, which is based on FTE. And th so that increases whenever FTE increases, and we also are asking for an inflationary adjustment to that as well. But it isn't as big of an increase as what it looks like on the spreadsheet. It's deceiving because it's um, based on a much bigger base general support budget than what it's shown. So it's really only about, I think, about a 17% increase. Uh, it looks higher on there because you're not factoring in what the indirect rate portion of the general support budget is. Senator Pitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Commissioner Blissenbach, uh, I'm looking at how much more you're, I mean, you're, you're holding the appropriation flat, the operating expenses flat from, uh, from the base, and yet we are taking a, an inflationary increase out of the work comp fund. Um, oh, wait a minute. I think I'm looking at the wrong numbers here. We're still holding the appropriation constant to base, even in this part, and we're uh, increasing the amount um, coming out of the work comp fund for maintaining current service levels. And it's it's a simple it's it's simple mathematics. It's you know it's it's uh, four point five million divided by eleven point eight million, and um, I suppose I could take it against the, you know, the 12 million, but it's not going to change the, it's not going to change the uh, ratio very much. And yet that's a, that's a special revenue dedicated fund that should be going in order. To, in, we need to make sure that fund is healthy for our, you know, for our program. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, and I, we have run um, lots of numbers to ensure that that fund is healthy and it is the money that is being spent from the work comp fund is going to the programs that it is intended to fund. So it is intended to fund our OSHA unit. It is intended to fund our work comp division. Um, and it is also intended to fund the IT support that needs to be provided to the work comp unit. Uh, so th the funds are going to support the areas of the department that ha are funded through the workers' compensation fund. They're not being used to fund other areas that are general fund or federal fund or so on and so forth. Mr. Pitt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It just appears to me that we are subsidizing uh, a, a probably what, what some would, well, we're subsidizing the uh, uh, target for this committee by taking out of the special revenue account. And I, and, and I find that troubling, Mr. Chair, that we talked so much about in the budget forecast and the general fund forecast that we needed to fund maintaining um, service levels, and yet we are taking a almost 40% increase out of the work comp fund to fund ongoing operations. Now, if this were a 4%, 5% increase like we've seen in some of the other areas, I probably, wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have highlighted it. But we're talking almost 10 times that amount from a rate standpoint. And so, Commissioner, I understand that you've got a, you know, a, whole, air, a, a whole department that's face, facing inflationary increases in salaries. But the fact of the matter is this particular fund is taking a greater hit than the general fund on those same issues. And I would argue that a 17% increase is out of the norm when the, the uh, uh, state economist has forecasted a 4% inflation rate. That this is, this is way higher than it needs to be. And I'm very concerned about this, Mr. Chair, that um, we are taking out of these special revenue funds in order to provide uh, what I can only suppose uh, priorities of the, you know, probably controversial priorities of the, of the majority, and using this, using this fund to subsidize it. I, it's, 
this is I, this is this is concerning to me. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I ask another question? Go ahead, Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Blissenbach. Under you know, on the spreadsheet right under that, um, we've listed uh, about uh, six million dollars in the first biennium and six point two million dollars in the second biennium for technology services reorganization. Can you explain that effort and why does it, with a with a brand new system that we've just invested in, why do I need why do we need to spend twenty five million dollars to reorganize over four years to reorganize this this unit and is this going to be an ongoing expense? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, so the technology re reorganization is doing a number of things. It is reorganizing the way that our technology support is set up in the department to ensure that the units um, that are using customized systems or versus the uh, systems that are bought kind of off the shelf and then, and then customized for those areas are paying the appropriate technology uh, support costs um, appropriate to the units. So that is really what that reorganization is meant to do, is make sure that the work comp area is paying for the IT support to support the work comp IT system, um, that the labor standards area is paying the appropriate amount to support the IT costs for their systems. Um, and so it's reorganizing that, having the work comp fund pay for the support of the work comp system, and then having the other areas support uh, pay for the support that they need. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Blissenbach, how is that, since it wasn't in the forecast, and I, I don't see it at least highlighted in any of the other areas, can you tell me where that would have been funded through in the past? Was that a general fund expense in the past? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, the question was how were the IT costs funded? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is that it depends on the unit. So IT costs for um, labor standards would be paid for out of the general fund. IT costs for OSHA would be paid for out of the work comp fund or federal, fu federal money if it, uh, the matching money we receive. Um, so it depends on the unit, but the general support costs are paid either through the work comp um, allotment or the workers' compensation fund allotment or the indirect costs that is paid out of the, the different units. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understood your, your question, and I don't mean to be argumentative, Commissioner. I'm looking at uh, the spreadsheet, page one, line seven, technology services reorganization. There's nothing in the base. And we add six million in the upcoming biennium and six point two million in the tails. And I guess my question was, where were those, where were those being funded in the past? Because it seemed again that you said they were being funded out of the work comp fund, and yet the spreadsheet would indicate that they weren't. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pratt, um, my understanding is that was paid from the work comp general fund. So the general fund money was going to, uh, to pay for minute costs that were used to support the, um, the systems that we've uh, developed. Senator Brett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Commissioner, why are we moving that from the work comp general fund to the work comp fund itself? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, because the workers' compensation unit um, it should be supported by the workers' compensation fund. So we're using the fund to ensure that the minute costs that are used to support the IT system that we use in workers' compensation is paid for through the workers' compensation fund rather than sharing that cost among the general support indirect rate that is what we use to pay minute um, rather than sharing those costs across the unit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Commissioner, just just so I'm clear, we're taking we're taking um, responsibilities that were paid for with general fund, whether they were general fund that went to the work comp committee, work uh, or work comp uh, unit, whether they were general fund 
uh, appropriations that we're going to support OSHA. We're moving. We're moving those work comp from the from. The, is there an offsetting uh, appropriation to the work comp general fund for now taking those out of the work comp fund itself? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, the indirect rate could be affected in the other units um, and likely will be affected if their costs uh, are for the general support that's provided, which includes the minute costs, is uh, goes down. Well, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, I'm you know I'm concerned that uh, what it appears that the author is doing is basically trying to double her target by shifting funds from general fund over to the work comp fund. Uh, we had mentioned, Mr. Nauman had mentioned she had an $8 million target and with this gimmick or shift or whatever we want to call it, we've just now increased the target to about $14 million. That's how I understand the discussion that we're having here today. If I understand Commissioner Blissenbach, these have always been expenses that we've had to cover. Now what we're doing are accounting gimmicks to make sure that we can increase the amount of general fund money that the committee can spend. Senator, Senator Pratt, um, these were governor's recommendations, it looks like, under lines six and seven. Mr. Chair? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it may very well be a governor's recommendation. This is the Minnesota legislature. We decide how and where we spend the money, okay. not the governor. And these have been paid out of general fund expenses in the past. And the only thing, whether the governor is suggesting that we somehow increase uh, the amount of general fund for additional spending or it's, it's the author, I really don't care. The fact of the matter is, is that we've effectively doubled the target for this for this committee. Senator Pratt, the targets were set knowing where the governor's recommendations were and where he was providing funding for workers' comp. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The targets were set based on the on the February forecast, and those February forecasts had those expenses baked into the. Uh, into the general fund expenditure. The governor does not have the, and MNB does not have the authority to presume that we're gonna shift an expense from one funding source to another. So I would still submit that the impact on this is effectively doubling the target and all we're doing is an accounting gimmick to increase the amount that can be spent for what has been historically a general fund expense. Commissioner, go ahead. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, I just w want to clarify that the money that we are asking from the Work Comp Fund for the IT infrastructure is to basically allow for the cost of the IT support for the workers' compensation system. Um, this allows us to kind of right size the allocation of costs that the indirect rate pays for for IT services to the other units. It's a more equitable way. Uh, than sharing the IT costs across the department. That's what we're asking to do. The work comp fund is funding work comp. It's not funding the areas that would not be appropriate for the work comp fund to fund. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. I'm not, I'm not questioning the use, I'm not questioning the, uh, the expense. Right, I'm questioning the funding source. And that, that had been a general fund expense as I understand our discussion trying to under, trying to trying to wrap our arms around this. This had been a general this had been a general fund expense that was appropriated to your department that we are now taking out of the work comp fund. And it that's the that's the the shift, that's the gimmick that is concerning to me. Um that we have historically funded because you've had IT service agreements in the past 
we're just changing the source of funds so that we can effectively double how much is being spent in this in on other initiatives in this area. That's that's the net outcome of what we're of what we're doing here. Um, Mr. Chair, would um, Senator McEwen? Thank you, uh, Senator McEwen. Um, we've for years we've been talking about OSHA penalties, and I see in your bill that you increase the OSHA penalties to to match the, uh, the 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 current federal penalties. Can you can you talk about what your intent is in that area? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for that question. And I'll, I'll ask the, perhaps the commissioner to weigh in as well. Um, my, uh, I'm, I'm actually very excited about uh, the Department of Labor and Industry really leaning in to um, these, this work uh, with the OSHA standards. Um, I, I think that um, it's evident to all of us on the Labor Committee through testimony that we have heard over the course of the session that this is a key area that Minnesota workers are experiencing right now, these, these injuries, uh, repetitive use injuries, um, some of the testimony that we heard from the warehouses where people are working, from meatpacking um, centers, uh, poultry processing workers, um, again and again hearing workers, Minnesotans come and testify about these injuries. So um, in my discussions with um, the commissioner and with um, the professionals at DLI, um, they've been discussing developing this department and so that Minnesota can be a leader in this area. So I, I'm very proud um, that that they're doing that and I'm proud to carry these, these, um, these um, parts in in the bill, and I'd, I'll also um, kick it over to the commissioner to add um, whatever Mr. she'd Fuller. like to add. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, I'll just add specifically as to um, the federal penalty conformity. Um, the goal with that is to maintain our end of the bargain with federal OSHA, which is to be at least as effective as federal OSHA. That's required for us to maintain our state plan status. Um, and we, to be honest, have not been uh, on par with federal OSHA as far as our penalties go. Um, so increasing the maximum penalty and um, allowing the adjustment in uh, the same as federal OSHA does um, allows us to maintain our at least as effective as uh, and maintain our state plan program. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how does our plan from a safety record uh, compare? As, as I recall, uh, our state OSHA plan and, and our injuries are, are below the national average. Does that continue to be the case? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, that is the case. We run a wonderful OSHA program in the state, uh, but there's always an opportunity to improve. Um, but what we have been hearing from federal OSHA is that by not having penalties that are on par with federal OSHA penalties, they, do, they consider that to be not uh, as effective as when it comes to penalty amounts. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if our penalties were higher than the federal OSHA, we'd expect even better results? Senator, Commissioner. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, we know that there are many aspects to workplace safety that are effective. Uh, education is incredibly inf effective. Uh, having consultation services is incredibly effective, but also penalties are effective. They are a deterrent for um, noncompliance. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, from my experience, uh, there's not a correlation between penalty and outcomes. And as, as you testified today and as I've seen in the past, Minnesota safety record and, and the work of your, your OSHA department, your Min OSHA department, um, has put us better than the national average. Even with lower penalties, we are better than the national average. I am concerned in this bill that there is 
a move to not conform with the federal guidelines, but to far exceed them. And so, Mr. Chair, I would offer the A24 amendment. Senator Pratt offers A24 amendment, which is, being, is going to be passed out right now. Pat, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, we can, have an, uh, we can have a debate on whether OSHA penalties drive safety results. And, and I think the, the empirical evidence would say that it is not. However, we've been having, and, and we've had this discussion for a number of years, we've been asking for uh, the feds to, to tell us that, you know, in fact, our, our program was, you know, at risk. And we, I, as chair, I never received any communication along that line. Uh, but let's, let's presume the commissioner is right. Let's presume that our penalties, in order to maintain our OSHA program, have to be um, on par with the federal penalties. This gives the commission, this, the A24 amendment allows the commissioner to uh, modify the fines to stay in conformity with federal requirements for state plans, but not to exceed them. Uh, and Mr. Ch so, Mr. Chair, it, it would effectively take out the automatic inflator and just assure that we stay compliant with the federal program. Um, and I request a roll call vote. Okay, on that amendment, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the um, A24 amendment, I'm looking at it here and it looks to me like what um, Senator Pratt, you're proposing is to replace this entire subdivision 6A, which um, as it appears in the bill has language about um, increasing the fines, um, and it, detail that um, regards um, violations that would cause or contribute to the death, death of an employee. Uh, it's, it's, it has some detail in here that I'm not seeing in this amendment that you've brought. Um, I, you know, I, I, overall, overall the way that I'm reading this amendment, what this says to me is, um, that Minnesota would not be allowed to, um, to, to go further or to lead. That this is what, what it says here is, um, the commissioner may increase the fines in these subdivisions only to the amounts necessary to conform with federal standards for penalty levels required for state plans. This is so. What the, how this reads to me is like let's let's do the least that we would need to do, and that's not okay with me. So I, uh, and and please correct me if I'm, I'm somehow reading it incorrectly, but it 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 takes out a very important piece of what this bill does and replaces it with something that seems to me to just be scraping the bottom of the barrel. And I think our, our workers in Minnesota deserve better than that. So I, respectfully, I would ask. Um, Members, for you to vote no on the A24. Further discussion on Senator Pratt's A24 amendment. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hewitt, and I would, I would wholeheartedly disagree with the way that you uh, talked about the amendment. There's nothing preventing this legislature from doing the changes that you want. There's nothing in this amendment that says that the legislature can't go in and make changes to specific penalties. We, we as the legislature can set those rates. The problem that I have is that you are putting an automatic inflator based on the consumer price index for all urban customers, right, which may or may not be the right inflator to put on here. Why aren't we using the... Um, uh, 
Oh, why am I drawing a blank on the name? Um, the, the same inflator that's being used by the Department of Revenue. Why aren't we, why is it for all consumer goods? Why not X food and energy? Why is it, there are multiple inflators out there and yet you've chosen one that talks about a consumer inflator and applying it as a penalty. And all I'm saying is that the commissioner can have the automatic authority to increase up to the federal level. But it's up to us as a legislature to make the decisions if those penalties for certain areas need to go higher. And there's nothing in this amendment that precludes the legislature from doing that. It precludes the commissioner from automatically increasing those fines above the federal conformity because one, we've established that there is no empirical correlation between penalties and safety record. Our penalties are below the federal standards and yet our safety record is better. And the commissioner has testified that we need to be as compliant with the federal guidelines, not necessarily that we have to exceed them in order to keep our men OSHA program uh, certified. So, Senator McEwen, I, you did in fact misstate the intent and the purpose of the, uh, of the amendment because I don't think the legislature should abdicate the responsibility of taking on those important policy questions, taking on those important, uh, uh, if, if we decide to go above and beyond federal conformity, that has to be a deliberate decision by the legislature, not an administrative decision. Senator Pratt, um, I think this, the, the bill would be the legislature saying we want to go this route. Um, Senator Friends on the Pratt Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to the A24. I was hoping to ask the commissioner a question. Um, if you know, Commissioner, how many other states uh, limit the ability to raise the OSHA penalties in this fashion, if you know? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Friends, um, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I believe that probably doesn't happen. Um, and I, I do also want to add that the way we drafted the language for this inflator was to make sure that we were keeping in line with federal, federal penalties because there is an inflator. Uh, for federal OSHA penalties. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further discuss, Senator Pratt. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner, for making my point. There is already an inflator for federal penalties, and we would have the authority to go above that. We don't need to set our own inflator in this case with uh, the CPI for all urban consumers. That, and if that's the inflator that's being used by the feds, then we should just conform with the feds. But uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm taking the commissioner at her word and saying, okay, we have to have penalties that, are, that conform with the federal standards. And the federal standards, as the commissioner testified, already have an inflator built in. And so there's no reason for us to redefine what these are. We could use the chain-weighted CPI. We could use the uh, CPI excluding food and, and fuel, we could um, we could use the the year over year. I think uh, uh, that was reported today at about five percent. Um, there are a number of different ways that we could be looking at this. And Mr. Chair, we had this discussion. We had this discussion when we took on your bill for the forecasting. And we were intentionally ambivalent, ambiguous on what that would be because we were going to allow the uh, uh, economic advisors to tell us what the appropriate CPI is. So we already have a penalty system that is pegged to inflation. We already have testimony that says we need to keep our penalties in line with the feds. And we have an amendment here that will now allow the commissioner to keep our penalties in line with the feds, but not abdicate that she increased those penalties above the feds, that that is the responsibility and the role of the legislature. So members, I, I wholeheartedly encourage that we uh, adopt this amendment 
um, and not continue to give the role of the legislature over to the executive branch. Now, we'll, we'll give them the chance to modify and keep us compliant. Commissioner, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy your argument on that one. But this, this is, to say that we're just gonna, we're just gonna be keeping up, that's not the intent here, and, and I don't know that um, we should be handing this authority over to just the commissioner to do that. I guess I'm starting to repeat myself, Mr. Chair, so I'll let it go to a vote. Okay, so the roll call has been requested. Staff will take the roll on the A24 Pratt. Westrom. Oh, Senator Westrom. Before that, go ahead, Senator Westrom. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess uh, to the commissioner, can you explain to us uh, when you'd go above what the federal uh, requirement is and how many, how many uh, such scenarios do we have where we're above it and what would be conditions that would uh, have you raising the penalty above it? I mean, what would, what would you use as a guide to say, oh, the federal's got it wrong, we, we need to double this instead? How, how, how would you, what would be your guidepost? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom, um, actually the language in the bill doesn't give me authority to do other than what's outlined in the bill. So it doesn't give the commissioner that authority. So it's based on a formula as set forth, and that's the formula that would be used to, uh, for the future increases in the maximum penalty. And Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, um, are we similar to other states uh, right now with our penalties? Do you, do you have any sort of analysis or do you look at any comparables to what Wisconsin's doing or Iowa or the Dakotas, which border my district? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, um, we are lower in our maximum penalty than all of our surrounding states because all of our surrounding states are federal OSHA states. And so, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, what has OSHA come to us and said, you're, you're too low, so we're going to take over the enforcement unless you raise it? Or what's, what's driving this change? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, yes, we have received a finding in our audit that our penalties are not, uh, because they are lower than federal OSHA, we are not as effective as federal OSHA uh, on the penalty front. And so, Mr. Chair, uh, what's what's as effective? I mean, what do you mean by that? Are they gonna are they gonna take back the enforcement of it if if we don't change this? Or what do, what does it mean when you say we're not as effective? Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, it could be that could be the case. We have agreed in our agreement uh, with Federal OSHA that we will maintain a program that is at least as as effective as Federal OSHA. That is. Uh, what we are audited on when federal OSHA does a state plan program audit, um, and this has been a finding. So it could lead to further action. Um, we have been having to communicate with them on the actions we're taking uh, in order to come into uh, compliance with the agreement, um, and we've informed them that we've introduced this, or that we've been working on passing uh, legislation that will allow us to conform with federal penalties. And so, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, uh, do you have a need to go beyond what the federal penalties are? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, the way that we have this drafted is to maintain uh, compliance with federal OSHA penalties. Um, and there are areas that we do go above, and, and, I, and I should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about how effective our program is. For instance, the legislature does have a higher penalty for workplace fatalities than federal OSHA does. That was passed by the legislature. Um, I believe it is part of the reason why we are, uh, we have such a great OSHA program, but this doesn't give the commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry to, to on their own go above federal OSHA. What this is doing is setting, uh, is conforming with federal OSHA penalties. And Mr. Chair, Commissioner, um, and, and Senator McEwen, I guess, 
I mean, I mean maybe, maybe it's time for the state to rethink. Uh, maybe, maybe it's okay to let the federal take over the enforcement and save, save that labor and uh, demand on your department. Uh, have you ever given that a thought? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I think, can you uh, restate your question? Sorry. Well, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner, I mean, we, we do have options here, and uh, it costs the state money to have labor uh, and, and staff and, and enforce all of the federal standards. Have we given serious thought to maybe, maybe it's worth unloading that expense and responsibility and demand on your department and let the federal government enforce this and then save that money and uh, demand on the resources in your department uh, and be able to focus on other things. Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, respectfully, I think that would be a bad path for Minnesota to take. There are many um, opportunities we have that federal OSHA's uh, plans do not have by having a state plan state. Um, we've been able to have staff that are available to answer questions, to provide compliance assistance to the employers that are located in this state. Um, it's a very uh, popular program within the department. Um, and without that, without having a state plan state, people would not be able to call up Many people know the director of OSHA and call them up and ask them questions. Uh, they would have to wait and go through the Eau Claire office or one of the uh, offices that would not be located here. Uh, the, the services that we can provide by being a state plan state to the employers and the workers in the state, um, I think the program speaks for itself. It's why we have a successful program. We're able to work directly with people and I think uh, the fact that we get the federal federal money to partially run the program um, and we can have such a, such a successful program uh, speaks as to why it's important to have a state plan state. So, so, so Mr. Chair, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting puzzled as I'm sitting here because now you're saying we've got such a successful program. Just five minutes ago you said we're on the verge of the federal government taking it back because our program isn't isn't uh, doing it, isn't as strong as the federal program. So which is it? Do we have a strong program or do we not? Senator Westrom, uh, that, I'd argue that, we have a I'm strong a little puzzled program. right now. Senator Westrom, I'd argue we have a strong program, but the penalties are not sufficient. So, uh, so I, Mr. Chair, I asked the commissioner the question. Sure, go ahead, commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, um, the finding that we have had in the audit is that the penalties are not on par with the federal penalties. It's not a, uh, it's not saying that the rest of the program is not at least as effective as, in fact, I think uh, federal OSHA would even recognize our state plan um, as being a good model. And in fact, they often call us to have our uh, director and inspectors speak at national training, um, it's that the penalties, the penalties is the issue here, and our penalties are not at the level that federal OSHA penalties are. And so, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, your earlier testimony led us to believe, or led me to believe, that we're on the possible uh, list of them taking back the enforcement because our system is not that good. I'm not hearing that out of you now. Are we on the verge of them taking back the enforcement because our program's not good enough? Yes or no? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, unfortunately that's not a yes or no question. We have had an audit finding. Um, they, have they started action to take away our state plan status? No, but the audit finding has been there. Okay, thanks. Senator Pratt, then let's move to vote on a 24 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Westrom, I, you know, I do want to say that um, I've talked to representatives from the business community and the labor community that uh, both are very appreciative that we have the, the Minosha program and, and have uh, continued to support us being uh, on a state plan versus the federal plan. And so that's not the issue here. Um, the reason, I, I, I believe 
our men OSHA plan is one of the reasons why our uh, workforce injury rates are below the national average. That's also why I've been able to say that I don't know that the penalties and the uh, rates of injuries are uh, empirically tied together. Uh, I, for you know, for several years we've been having this discussion. It's been in the audit, but I never felt like we never got anything from from the federal OSHA program that said if you don't increase your penalties, we're going to pull your certification. Um, because I do believe that it would have to be, a, you know, something greater to be not conforming. But if we are going to say that we want to conform across the board with the federal program and our penalties need to be in compliance with federal penalties, then the A24 amendment is exactly where we need to be. And the commissioner said it herself. She said, well, this language will just give me the ability to do it, uh, to, to, to keep the penalties in check with the feds. Well, it really doesn't because we define a consumer price index for all urban counties. We allow the penalties to go up, but if there's a negative rate, they don't go down. Um, there are other parts of this uh, of this subdivision 6A that go well beyond compliance. And so the A24, actually, members, I would suggest that the A24 brings us more in line with what the commissioner has described than what's actually in the bill and why we should support it. I'm not, I'm buying into the commissioner's argument that we should fix the audit deficiency. And we should assure that we don't get into an audit deficiency in the future by, we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll tie our penalties to the federal penalties. And when the federal penalties go up with inflation, our penalties will go up with inflation. We should not be setting our own inflationary benchmarks. On the A24 amendment, a roll call has been requested. Staff will take the roll. Chair Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dreheim? Senator Eichhorn? Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? There being three ayes and seven nays, the motion does not prevail. There are further discussion or further amendments. If not, um, as I indicated earlier, we are going to incorporate this into the other bill. So Senator Friends moves that we lay Senate file 2782 as amended on the table. Is there a discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Um, Senator Champion moves to take Senate File 3035 as amended off the table. So that's my amendment. Is uh, there that's any? my motion. Good, thank you. Is there any discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Champion, will you move to amend Senate File 3035 by adding the contents of Senate File 2782 as amended into Senate File 3035 and instruct the staff to make technical and conforming changes? That's my motion, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, no. motion prevails. Senator Champion moves that Senate File 3035 as amended be recommended to pass. That's my motion, Mr. Chair. Is there further discussion on that motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. We have a caucus in about 15 minutes. And so what I'd like to is Senator Klein in the room. No. No. What I'm going to... 
suggest we recess until I will suggest 6:30 or the call of the chair. It won't be before 6:30, unfortunately. I don't think. What do you say? Um, with that, um, Senator Westrom. Yes. Just uh, the purpose for the recess, and can you give us just a blueprint of the rest of the? Schedule? Sure. We have one bill remaining, the Commerce Bill, and we will be taking that up this evening yet, but um, it's Senate file 2744. It would be going traveling on its own. I don't know how long that will take, but um, we have a caucus at 5 o'clock, and I was going to suggest till 6.30 is a realistic time for coming back. But if people, if, if members are available before then, and it would happen before then, would contact you, but make sure people can be back. But it would not be before 6.30 otherwise. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, we're in recess until 6.30 or the call of the chair. Thank you.